participants over here. Now we are about to start our international webinar on role of civil engineers for sustainable development, which is about to start. And this is a three days program. And though it is mentioned as civil engineering, I appreciate that all the faculties and students and practicing engineers and retired people of various domains may kindly join also so that this is more or less going to be an interdisciplinary talks many of them of course we'll be discussing other details also and today we have our chief guest and the panel lead dr kv jagumar sir is a professor from the civil engineering department of nad warangal he has been the professor since in the cadre grade itself from 1998 itself so having more than 22 years of service as professor cadre professor so sir you are immense uh, valuable uh, positions as well as the contact all over the world is brought to us this day and uh, professor kv jagumar sir was there in our all days of uh, programs and uh, from the inception onwards his guidance was so much so that that's how we could come on this day. And on behalf of the all audience over here, uh, let me thank Professor Jagumar sir. We are starting this program itself. And uh, welcome to all the participants, panel members, and everyone to this program. And also we have the keynote speaker from the academia, uh, Dr. Nitin Kumar Tribadi sir, who has already been here with the last half an hour and be a bit with us also. He's also a product of NAT Warangal and is currently is a professor from the Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand. I'm sure that uh, during the introduction, uh, our colleagues will be giving more insight and details of the work which you have done. Let me glance to the next two days program also. On the 15th of July, we have uh, engineer Sriniti Anadaraman is the managing director of Geodesic Technique Private Limited from Bangalore. They have been doing a number of projects uh, in India and abroad also. One of the projects which I mentioned earlier was the, the 32 acres of uh, project which they have done in Mumbai airport, the reconstruction. They were doing the reconstruction work uh, when the airport was running. That is the most challenging work and also probably you'll be able to ask him later on. And Dr. Alfred J. Kalyanapu is an associate professor from the Tennessee Technological University, USA. He's the best well-known academician and definitely he is going to join. Uh, and on 16th, we have the chief guest, Dr. N. V. Ramana Rao, sir, is the director of NAT Warangal. And he has been so many experiences and all he is going to share with us. Followed by on the next day, we have the keynote speaker, engineer NNS, NNSS Rao, sir, the chief engineer of Central PWD Hyderabad with eminent experience. And we have the other panel members, Professor Shaini Vargi, Secretary of Civil Engineering of MBITS Engineering College for the Mangalam And myself, Dr. P. Sojan Lal. So let me hand over to Manchu for introducing the guest. Guest panel members and welcoming all after the minute. We'll be handed over to Professor Jagumar, sir. He'll be the panel head and he'll be further taking up the proceedings. Over to Manchu George, please. Thank you, Dr. Sojan, sir. Let me introduce our panel lead and the chief guest of today, Dr. K.V. Jagumar, Professor, Higher Administrative Grade, Department of Civil Engineering, NIT Warangal. Dr. K.V. Jagumar has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from NIT Suratgarh and has done his MPIT and PhD from IIT Kanpur. Yeah, sorry for sorry for the interruption. Live to the Facebook, please. Uh, it is already live. Please go ahead. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you, sir. He is specialized in the areas of hydrology and water resources engineering, environmental engineering and management, wetland hydrology, and environmental flows. He was on deputation as the executive director, Center for Water Resources Development and Management, Calicut, from 2008 to 2011, during which time he had full additional charge as director, Kerala School of Mathematics, and director, Center for Science and Technology Entrepreneurship Development, Kerala, Government of Kerala. He had visiting assignments at the University of Essen, Germany, Griffith University, Brisbane, Australia, and University of Paradenia, Sri Lanka. Professor Jay Kumar is on the advisory committee of various national agencies related to water resources and professional bodies. He was part of the eight member working group constituted by the UNESCO for preparing a document of urban water management. 
recently he has been recognized by the distinguished alumnus award from nit suratgal during the diamond jubilee celebrations of the institute and dr kg rangaraju award for excellence in water resources research in the year 2019 with great pleasure i am inviting you to the session over to you professor k v j kumar welcome sir welcome to this please unmute and go ahead sir good morning all of you good morning sir can take about half i can take about half an hour for the, the yes sir yes sir please yes. go ahead half an hour and also requesting all other panel members keep please keep the mute position except jay kumar sir so that no other disturbance yes sir please 30 minutes fine sir then we will take the questions after going to nidin sir is the screen clear yes sir very much clear i need a blackboard sir yes sir good Uh, good morning, all of you. I'm really happy to be part of this uh, uh, international workshop webinar on uh, sustainable development in civil engineering. And I thought I should talk on one of the topics which is dear to me: urban stormwater management, with which I've been working quite a lot. I think uh, for this is a common thing for all engineers. The four uh, so, for things which I mentioned here: what you love doing, what you're good at, what you can pay for, what the world needs. what you love if you are good at what you love doing it's called passion if you are paid for what you are good at that's called profession if you if the world needs somebody and you are you are paid for it i mean you are not specialized in that particular field but you still work on that that's called vocation but what you if you love doing whatever the world needs that's called mission the intersection of all these four is is the purpose of what we are doing today now coming to water you can just see the where is that's water 96.5% of the world's water is in the oceans and another 0.9% is saline water we are just 2.5% as fresh water in the whole world very fresh water glaciers and ice caps and groundwater consume a lot of it we have only 1.2% of fresh water as available surface on other fresh water just 1.2% of fresh water available and look at that we have only 0.49% or the 1.2% as the water available rivers which we are park working for so just to give a, a pictorial view you have the globe on which you have the water and you have a drop so fresh water is a small drop that you see that's what they are fighting for between states between countries this is a very beautiful pictorial picture which i got from one of the usgs journals now in the when we just entered the millennium this was the water available to the world 1950 the this color this picture shows the color is dark it is bad the color is light it is good so 1950 india was much better 95 we have become darker and if we continue the same rate in 2025 we are going to be very bad that is india bangladesh pakistan afghanistan iran iraq whole gulf and northern part of africa is going to be bad politically uh, uh, situation this map was released just before the millennium and it is not accepted by many countries this map was revised and this map was prepared and it shows i am just talk about our country only india you find the central portion of india is red color it says there is physical water scarcity okay if i supply water need for everybody i don't have water the coastal areas starting from west bengal to orissa to tamil nadu kerala uh, karnataka coastal karnataka goa and uh, maharashtra they are in Uh, mustard yellow color it says economic water scarcity what is available but no money to develop the blue, blue color says that there is no water scarcity at all now look at the world the whole of northern part of the world is in blue color and the whole of southern part of the world is in yellow or red so this is a very interesting uh, picture so most of developed countries are having the, uh, control of the water so this is something which was uh, accepted in 2025 but then I mean, this is what is going to be in 2025, another four years from now. But this map was not also also accepted, and then this was revised in the year 2013. Uh, now we see here, this is given in terms of availability of water. Now look at India. India is water stressed, water vulnerable country, and all those uh, yellow color, red color, dark colors are having problem. And if you go to lighter color, they have no problem. So if you know, if I 
whole of America, both South America and North America, whole of Australia, northern part of Asia consisting of China, uh, Europe, etc. Do not have any problem. Similarly, the western part of Africa do not have problem. Eastern part of Africa, whole of India, part of China, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh, and then you have all this yellow colored shows is going to be severe water scarcity. This is the accepted picture which is uh, we are working now. Now, what is sustainability? Sustainability is very beautifully developed by Madame Brundtland, who was the Prime Minister of Norway in, uh, Nor uh, Norway in 1987, says, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own need. That means we are, uh, whatever we are doing should be for the present, the future can take care of themselves. So we do not have, uh, we can't, don't compromise on the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. So is we have technical sustainability, we have environmental sustainability, we have financial sustainability, we have social sustainability, we have institutional sustainability. So sustainability in terms of all these are very, very important. Now, in, in water sector, we have many challenges. We have to meet the basic needs of water for the human consumption, we live in needs, essential for human well-being, and to empower people, especially women, through a participatory process of water management. Securing the food supply is also very important. Then water supply must be reliable in small towns and mega cities, it's very unreliable. Urban areas, raw sewage overflows into open drains. Rural areas, hand pumps can remain out of order for months. While latrines too often are used for purpose other than that for which they're designated. Financially sustainable, that's very, very important. May a few mega cities recover uh, charges from full of uh, all the charges from water supply and service, including operation maintenance, but most urban operations uh, cannot do this. Then must be environment sustainable, whatever you do must not spoil the environment beyond repairs. Villages relying on groundwater suffer from rapid depletion of kefirs. This mining for irrigation purposes is encouraged by highly subsidized power rate. This is very important. In fact, one of the reasons given by the World Bank why the water level in India is going down is because of highly subsidized or free power. Because of free power, we pump out a lot of water. So groundwater level has gone down, not because we misuse the water, but because there is free power or subsidized. It was a very, very important conclusion which has been released. Then water must be affordable to everybody. Whatever we pay must be good. See, we don't, we don't want to pay more to the municipal corporation, but we don't mind paying 20 rupees per liter of water when we go out to buy. Municipal corporation, we buy only 200 rupees or 300 rupees a month. Whereas, uh, if they increase by 50 rupees, it's protest. Even corporates or MLAs are not ready to increase the prices. So we have, when as urbanized, we got water crisis. Uh, I'll just show some. You find many countries have severe water problem. So India is the second largest urban system next to China in the world. India is urbanizing very fast. What does urbanize, uh, urban mean? Large concentration of people in a relatively small area. The village might be having a thousand population, whereas in urban area, one tower, a multi-story tower could have. 1,000 people. So India is urbanizing very fast. The rate at which urbanizing is shown here from 1991 to 2030. I've shown in 1991, 220 million people were in the urban area. 2001, 290. 2008, 340 million. And 2030, we are going to have 590 million out of the 1470 million uh, people in the urban area. That means 40% of people are going to be in the urban area. So we'll have to take care of a lot of it. So when we urbanize, water needs shifted from agriculture to municipal and industrial uses, making decisions about allocating water from different sectors very difficult. So, just to give an idea, how many ULBs, urban local bodies, were there at the time of independence? We had about 2,800. Now we are having around 5,200. Number of class one towns, there was only 751. Now we are having 550 class one towns. Five metros at time of independence. Now we got seventy-five cities, which are which are you can read as metropolitan cities. So it's, it's economic city cities are economic uh, the growth of economy. Sixty percent of contribution of the Indian economy comes from the cities, and all cities are also hubs of enterprise, innovation, pe people, and politics. And a lot of productivity is uh, is the, the, the dependence on national state economic growth on the productivity of the cities. So just to show the GDP level. In 1980, 81, 47% of GDP came from the urban areas. There's now 73% of GDP comes from urban areas. So it shows how important urban area is now. But what is happening now is uh, we don't invest too much money 
in the urban infrastructure, low level in investments, it goes to low level of services. The low level of services that people are not willing to pay, low level of willingness to pay. When the willingness pay is very low, you got poor cost recovery, and when the cost recovery is very low, there's a low level investment. So this is what is happening today. It's called low level in equilibrium trap. Now this must be changed to a higher level of, uh, 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 higher, higher equilibrium trap. We don't have a trap. So here we have high level of investment infrastructure, which means we are giving better improved levels of service. When service is good, the higher willingness to pay and willingness to charge. When, so when uh, they are ready, people are ready to pay, higher resource mobilized. And this, so you find from the earlier vicious circle, now we got to virtual circle. Today, this is the guiding principle uh, that we have to invest higher amount of money in the infrastructure. Now, in September 15th, we started what we call sustainable development goals. Earlier in 20, in 2000, in the year 2000, we had billion dollar of goals. So now we got what we call sustainable uh, development goals. So there are in million dollar goals, there are uh, eight important goals, out of which only one, number seven, says ensure environment sustainability. There's water environment, there's only one particular out of eight goals, only one of them related to water environment. So in, if you got, come to this from million dollar goals, sustainable development goals, we are in million dollar goals, the year 20, uh, 2000, we had eight goals and 21 targets, but today, in sustainable development goals, there were 17 goals and 169 targets. And these targets must be achieved by 2030. And water and sanitation have go own goal, water and sanitation is relevant to all, all countries. So this is very, very important that now we are thinking that water sanitation is very, very important. Now look at this uh, water sanitation. This is the sustainable development goal number six. Uh, we have all types, we take a water uh, quality, we take the efficiency of supplying water, integrated manager water, universal water, universal sanitation. This is the present day goal. So this is a problem we see in many cities. This is a place photograph I took in Rajasthan. These are my photographs. I've taken Rajasthan. These are a common sight we see everywhere. This is where we have to supply water to trains in many cities. And this is where you know people uh, you know, they celebrate water collected in a check dam. That's when a check dam is constructed, when people celebrate it. This is a typical scene in a flood in Odisha a few years back. This is what happened in Hyderabad. You find how the flooding situation comes here. Uh, but in, most interesting is in our country, uh, most of the old place worship and temples, they had their own so water collected in the in the uh, tanks. These were one of the major investment practices which we followed for thousands of years, but now all the temple tanks are dry. And the temple tanks were constructed for basically as a water harvesting structure. See some of the temples, these are in Tamil Nadu. Uh, this is the Madhuradakam temple. In, uh, see. So now we also see the water projection. This is one example I'm giving Hyderabad. Uh, when the year 1991, the population was 3.3 .3 million and they had 722 billion liters of water required, but they had only 545, so they merged more water, they try to get water from other sources. In three years, the population increased to 4.35 million. Water requirement increased to 913 uh, million liters per day, but they, they could get another 680 million liters per day from other source. And in 2001, they got some more sources. You find water requirement for 1105 million liters per day, and they could get 1,090 liters per day from various sources. In 20, 2011, all the sources in and around Hyderabad were collected and we found maximum amount of water available is 1,906 milliliters against the water requirement of 18, 1,862. That means we had more water than what is required. But we cannot increase the 1906 more than this. So if we, today, the Hyderabad population has touched across one crore, that is 10 million. The water requirement is 2,224 milliliters, but then water availability is not increased. So this is a typical picture of Hyderabad city, which is well documented. Many cities are not documented like the way this has been documented. And this is one of my favorite pictures, how the water supply system started in the world. In fact, we were the first one to show pipes. And our pipes had bamboos. Bamboos are hollow. So the pipe system with a wide stair-shaped stub 
the water is, uh, you know, uh, the, the bamboos are supported and the water is taken from higher level to lower level. This is one of the first well-documented uh, water distribution system uh, and then pipe, pipeline system came much later. So let us see what are the uh, sustainable development goals. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduce inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, partnership for the goals. If I am so out, these are 17 goals which are under the Sustainable Development Goals, which was released in September 25th, 2015. So you find there are many, many of these are related to water and environment. So you find what, when we design a, a water management system in the city, we take care of the economics, public health, perception of risk and nuisance. We have to have a good idea about the meteorology of the place. We have to have an idea, good idea of the hydrology, of the hydrology and we have to have a good idea of hydraulics. So we want to manage water in the city is not just enough if you learn only civil engineering. You need to know a lot of economics. We learn to learn a lot of statistics. We have to know about risk. We have to learn about meteorology. So these are all very, very important so that we can design a proper drainage system for city. Now, when you talk about management practices, we've got structural management and we've got non-structural management. Structural management includes where structurally intensive things are there. So we've got channelization with good channels. Balancing ponds, recharge basins, rooftop storage, forest pavements, all these include a lot of money. And qualitative for effluent treatment at source, source control is very important. Balancing pond, recharge basin. There are many non structural activities. So, preservation of local landforms, we have floodplain zoning, and the qualitatively street sweeping, gully cleaning, anti litterization, control of de icing, etc. These are different parts of the world. So what is the best management practice? The best management practice is a stormwater control system it is economically and technically feasible as a means of reducing the quantity of stormwater and pollutants to meet the water quality goals. So this is what we call BMP, best management practices, which are, which are being used. I'll just go, be going through many of these BMPs that are available. So where do you apply this? So for having a good BMP, you need good surface water availability from stream flow records. So based on past records, we have to have this sustainable uh, availability. Then we've got design storm concept, stormwater detention pond designs, culvert as outflow control device, stormwater offline detention pond design, swale design. I'll show you a small swale design example here, stormwater reuse, storm sewer design, and water quality improvement. So here, most important are the drainage system. You have a major drainage system, minor drainage system, underground drainage system, surface drainage system. And in drainage system, we need to have very important source control, on-site and off-site technologies for control of runoff, infiltration of stormwater, construct a wetland. I'll give an example of construct wetland, which we have designed in Warangal City. So I'll skip some of this. This I've already done this. So I'll talk about what is a swale. A swale is a vegetated open channel that infiltrate uh, the runoff infinite transport of water. So when you have which open channel, velocities are reduced. So low velocities prevent transport and loss of soil. The vegetation within the swales are very effective for removal of solids and retention of swales. So this is something which we are now trying to do everywhere. So you see the, uh, it's a simple Manning's equation that we're using. We can get a length of swale as K, which is a, uh, you know, a coefficient that is a function of slope and size slope parameter, two is the discharge that has been infiltrated, n is the Manning's equation, and then slope, Manning's value, f is the infiltration rate. So, you see, these are which every civil engineer can easily derive this equation uh, from the Manning's equation. So, the size slope we have, we have got a k factor, these are already available in many, many literature. And the, so, if the, if the swale block is, block is limited, we can calculate what is the water that can be stored and what is infiltrated. So I've given a small example here. What swale length would be necessary to infiltrate all the water for the following data? Some, some data available. You've got the Manning's equation, you've got the slope, 
you got a discharge that is uh, inf to be infiltrated, you got infiltration rate. So length I calculate is 2,200 meters of land there. So if the land is available only 76 meters, so what do I do? So I have to now create a volume of 11.1 .1 cubic meters per second. I'll be sharing this presentation after my talk to Dr. Sojan Lal, so he can share it with the people who are interested to have this. And we use the storm water for many things. Uh, reuse storm water reduces the volume of discharge storm water, decrease the loss of potential freshwater sources, and increase the pollutant discharge from the system. So let us see, storm water can be used for irrigating open lands, recharging groundwater, supplementing water for cooling purposes, supplementing car wash water, enhancing and creating wetlands, supplying water for agriculture use. So if you use storm water, it can be used for all this. Uh, so it's, storm water is not something to be drained off. It is a resource. Storm water is not to be drained out just out like that. You should treat storm water as a resource. So non-structural BMPs, I just mentioned some of this. So we have to have organized collection of household chemicals, transport of chemicals and hazardous waste, street drainage design standards, active contact with industrial discharges, proper dis disposal of pet dropping. This is something which is just pick up in India. A lot of pets, the droppings of the pet also join the uh, receiving water system, so that must be properly disposed. So uh, these are some of the things which I already mentioned, local disposal of infiltration, percolation, on-site detention, retention, use of treatment wetlands. Uh, then we got at source control, control of integrated, controls integrated drainage systems, management of receiving water. So I'll just give you some more of this. Now, this is some of the water sensitive urban design practices. So any design is water sensitive. So most of the, today, this is a very common name that is used, WSUD, water sensitive urban design. In fact, any industry, anything should be water sensitive because water is very important. So you can have a sediment basin as shown in the first picture. So this sediment removes, it removes meter at almost 70, 90% efficiency. You can see a swale picture here. Uh, it's a channel-like thing, and it can uh, the slope provides only one one to one to four percent. And you have bioretention basin, retention basin with a lot of plants. A constructed wetland, a wetland is constructed uh, so that it uses auto natural processes. And you got an infiltration system where water gets infiltrated, and you got a sand filter where you know water just automatically goes into the ground. And you've got ponds and lakes are created. You've got green roofs and gardens, which are very, very common nowadays. So these are all new methods of design we have. So most effective methods for direction uh, are the source control, splash plants, extension pipes, cisterns, soccer pit, seepage trails, and porous pavements. And uh, these are some of which I just mentioned. Who should be involved in all this? Public and com community leaders, the slum dwellers, land developers, farmers, environmentalists, and local politicians. Because all these, this uh, takes some interest. For example, local politicians have priority issues respond to local constitutional demands. Farmers talk about peri-urban community uh, who are living in the areas. So all these people are involved in the uh, water management system. So we have urban landscaping facilities helpful to stormwater uh, management. Site assessment, choosing the facility, facility sizing, methodology is used in sizing facility. I'll show you many of the landscape areas, urban pervious uh, pavements, a rain garden is where you can see a vegetated open land here, a stormwater planter, where, where the stormwater storm water passing, you put some plants. I'll skip some more of this. You have the wetland system here. Uh, what is collected, this is done in, this is a picture I've taken from other countries. This is all being copied into India. At the residential level, we have to, uh, uh, at the start, source control is very important. Very simple landscaping which are used at the residential level are shown before pictures. You find the residential areas, how storm water and manage. Don't take it out, you just soak it wherever is possible. Using, you know, this type of technology. You have, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, in the research areas where you have a small play point, unpaved, but where the water can be infiltrated. 
So you find, uh, you know, uh, if the surface area, you can have a landscape area, uh, the runoff, etc., can be collected and then stored. So when you have a rain garden, that means the water which is uh, 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 developed, uh, which, which is falling on the gardens are used. So a lot of management costs is getting decreased. The groundwater recharge is improved. There's a real estate value. Once you have a good rain garden, the real estate value goes up. The community join together to develop the garden. So these are some of the pictures of the rain garden that I that we have. These are all some of them are from our country, some of the neighboring countries, mostly from Asia. You find the various uh, places that was somewhat is managed. You find the center of a road, you have a channel, but these are uh, swales. All these come under sustainable technologies. So some general guidelines are given, and uh, these are available in many, many literature. Do not plant trees or shrubs known to have long tap roots. I mean, roots must be small, shorter. Plant trees have shrubs at least 15 feet. That is up to five meters per perforated pipes. Plant trees have at least 25 feet from the riser structure. So these are some of the common guidelines that we use. So, and use native plants as much as possible. Don't get exotic plants. So they evolve naturally in a particular region. You just see here non-natives and natives. So they see similar plants, but then they grow in a different uh, thing. Okay, you have a deep root system of native plants help develop pore space in the soil to promote infiltration, infiltration rainfall and sustain them during dry periods. It's a very common thing that we use. You find the plants which are native have a deeper root and the deeper root develop pore space. In a poor space, the water gets infiltrated into the, into the ground, and this can be sustained in the longer and uh, the dry periods that we have. So I'll just skip some of this. I'll give an example of Warangal. Uh, this historic city is spread over an area of 70 square kilometers. So wastewater and trauma are, are all going through an open channel. So we need a wastewater treatment system. So this is an open channel which is carrying both wastewater and strong water. This is uh, in a, a Part of a large open drain the city, and we try to you know block it, uh, widen the area, and then we construct a barrier, and we constructed a wetland, which was you know diverted only five cubic meters per day. This is existing, and uh, you find uh, this, there are my colleague and my doctoral student worked on this. We fill up clay, and then uh, that's the the whole structure that we have, after filling up, we fill up soil. And then we put these plants, which are called typha plants, uh, four to six uh, plants per square meter. And this is after three months, the plants grew like this. And then I started diverting water from the open drain, which I showed earlier, along this, uh, through a, a, a small channel, where I can measure the amount of water that we have. And this lady is Margaret uh, Greenway from Australia, who, who saw my work and came to see my work. She was quite impressed with what we have. And then she invited me to her university to spend some time. That's how I could go to Griffith University. And you just see the results. You find there are many parameters we, me we measured. Now, the main parameters are BOD, five-day BOD. You find during the summer months, the BOD is very high. And these are the average raw wastewater, raw wastewater values. So after, so this is the picture that we have. We are, uh, then we, when we widened the channel, the BOD level came down from 200 and odd to 150 plus. So you find these are the values at the uh, inlet of the wastewater, inlet wastewater, 166, 176, I have not, Talk about all the parameters, we'll just take out BOD. And then after it passes through the wetland, it came down to 13, 9. The values of range is from 9 to 30, which is the permissible limit for discharging of the wastewater into uh, uh, land. So I'm able to reduce without any chemicals, without power, just use the plants from 200 plus to about 9 in the month. And that too, the reduction is very high in the 
summer months when the water is no water i could reduce to 9 ppm in the month of may to 13 in the month of april and june is around 16 so you find the best reduction i got in the summer months so so this in terms of picture you find uh, how different parameters are shown so you can find that after this this sweep we have measured for almost 15 months so we find the removal efficiency was almost 90 percent of various uh, nutrients that we have so these are values that are numbers almost uh, 80 to 90 percent removal of BOD, BOD is possible in that particular wetland which we did the study in this picture which shows the BOD level before and after in fluid and fluid, you can just see how much we are able to reduce. Um, especially in the months of April, May, the reduction is very, very large. So the various parameters that we have, total suspended solids, the total gel down nitrogen, COD, the total phosphorus, all these are drastically reduced by just using, uh, without using any chemicals. So we found that uh, this system can be used and we have this is presented in some various international conferences. I'll, I'm very happy to inform you that in the, month, in the country of Tanzania, where I presented this, most of the wastewater treatment system is replaced by Oracle technology. In fact, the presented there in Tanzania the next day, there's a main news item about the Warangal experience, the local Swahili language paper. So they have actually adopted this in many places. And this is one picture, which is one of my very uh, important, very close picture that I see. How much is the revenue water water produce in our country? You find on the extreme most box shows water produce. The second box shows how much is authorized consumption, how much water loss. The third picture loss from the authorized consumption, how much build and authorized, how much unbuilt and authorized. So build on authorized means you're authorizing somebody to use it as you're building it. Unbuilt authorized means to the legislative assemblies, to the Raj Bhavan, to the government, government officers. We are authorizing, but we are not building it. So build and authorize in code, build and metered, build and unmetered. So that, that's called revenue water. That means money that we get. But from that, how much collected is only very small amount, uncollected is very large amount. So you go to the last column, you find the amount of water that produces so much, the amount of money that's collected so much, all these are uncollected money. So they're called non-revenue water. So now main idea is how to reduce the non-revenue water so that the water is improved. This is something which is happening across the world. So we produce so much water, but we get so much of very little, it is unsustainable. So this, I have been, I have presented a lot of municipal corporates in the country that reduce uh, the non-revenue water so that you are able to run your system with the money that is collected. In fact, I, as I told you, when you want to improve the water pricing, even by 50 rupees a month, there's so much protest from the local uh, corporations and the MLAs and MPs, they said, not in my elected term, I will not increase my elected term. This is a common term that is used. I will not increase the water, water at all, water price at all. So I'll stop here. So this, if you've got any queries, they can send a mail to me, I'll reply and answer. And I would like to show you one picture, which is my very pet picture. This was a lake, a Kotuli wetland in Kerala which we try to improve the quality. We use the same plant, which I use Warangal. We put it there, and then in six months, I could improve water by 90%, which is almost drinkable. So I was trying to take the water, and then one of my scientists says, please hold it, let me take the picture. These are my hands. In, in, the, in, the, in Calicut City, in the year 2011, when the whole wetland was converted into an extremely good quality source of water, if to, Code Municipal Corporation, and these are my hands. And you know, my so this is one of my pet picture, which I showed that the quality of water can be improved by just using plants, which is sustainable, where you don't have use chemicals, where you don't use any power. So, the, but the only thing is, technology must be accepted by the various people. So, this is a one example I showed, and then you know, this became a very big hit in the national level, where you know, we got a lot of recognition. So, thank you so much. Professor Jagumar, sir, thank you so much for taking us into the various aspects of, of uh, this very important uh, subject. And you address one of the most challenging 
problems in the world and definitely we cannot live without the clean water that's number one and the sustainable development goals you started with the 17 median development goals i request all the students and the faculty members kindly go through the, that in details and get involved with the students some of the projects which we can do that and also the best managing practices within the shortest possible time so you could demonstrate to us and also the research topic which you have given with the actual case study permitting the shortest time we had about half an hour sir you are one of the best well known professors among the nit and iit fraternities and the international academicians and the industrial community that brings another example what you have proved in the tanzania the international experience sir we are proud of you sir the economic factors are well illustrated and the revenue model revenue water and the non revenue water that is really something which every one of us has to keep in our mind it's really an amazing presentation and the last picture the wetland converted taken at a caricature sir we are all inspired with your talks that's really amazing in behalf of all the panel members and all the participants sir thank you so much so inspiring presentation and that's how whenever we are coming to the nit varangal campus everyone says about your name you stand distinct once again thank you very much on behalf of this over to manchu for introducing to our one of the most uh, prevalent uh, speaker of the day from the academy this is professor dr nitin tripathi sir over to manchu please thank you jen sir our next keynote speaker dr nitin kumar tripathi dr nitin k tripathi is a professor in remote sensing and geographical information systems in asian institute of technology thailand over with 32 years experience in teaching research and projects apart from this he has also served as the leader of information and communication technology and coordinator for the remote sensing and gis field of study he has earlier served in various administrative positions in ait such as dean school of engineering and technology director academic quality assurance and accreditation chairman academic development review committee and currently as the director of special degree program he is the president of iit alumni association thailand member of india social club thailand and faculty advisor of iit indian association dr nitin kumar tripathi has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from nit warangal and has done his mtech and phd in remote sensing from iit kanpur his research focuses in the application of geoinformatics in environment marine health and agriculture fields he also work on development of wireless gis using the concept of internet gis and wireless devices such as wireless lan personal digital assistant with mobile phone he has developed real time spatial data logger auto automatic solar powered weather station and remote monitoring system of heart patients dr tripathi has a total of 197 publications to his credit which include two books 11 chapters in books 125 research papers in peer reviewed journals and 59 conference papers he has supervised 44 doctoral and 148 masters thesis dr nitin kumar tripathi is an active life member of association for geo information technology indian society of remote sensing indian society of geomatics and indian society of technical education also he is the editor in chief of international journal of geo informatics he has been recognized by different awards and honors like dae young scientist award by the department of atomic energy in 1994 aict career award for young teacher in 1996 OCU Distinguished Scientist Award by Osaka City University in 2007 and several best paper awards in various international conferences he was awarded the distinguished alumni award by NIT Warangal in 2016 with much pleasure inviting you to the session over to you professor nitin kumar tripathi thank you very much i'd like to share my presentation
So we can go to the display mode. Yeah. Good. Uh, which mode? Okay, yeah, this is fine, sir. This is good. Okay. So, good morning to all the participants, Dr. Lal, principal of the college, for organizing this very useful webinar. And I'm also very happy to listen to Professor Jay Kumar, a very thoughtful talk. He always gives a lot of ideas. And today, a uh, very good idea how the water can be managed in urban areas. So it is really useful. So my talk will be about sustainable city. Uh, we are seeing that uh, urban areas are growing everywhere. And uh, all the people want to live in the urban areas. So how to make the city sustainable? That is the talk that I'm going to address. So uh, as Professor Jagmar told that there are uh, 17 sustainable goals, of which the sustainable goal number 11, it makes uh, it is related to the make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. This is the main thing for urban areas and how to make uh, uh, these human settlements like sustainable. So one thing is like for everything there is a life. So if we don't make anything sustainable, that will die out soon. And same thing is happening with many urban centers in India, like they are becoming crowded. Too many people are living together and there is no hygiene. It is difficult to maintain that. And of course, the greenery is eaten away by the, uh, means a lot of infrastructure which is coming. So for sustainability, we have to look for the human com healthy communities. For the communities who are living, they should be healthy. It means they should have a good environment, natural environment. And uh, to, we have to preserve the natural environment as much as possible as per the guideline. And also we have to provide them economic viability. So we cannot just say that make everything green, then there is no economic viability and nobody will live in the city. So we have to make economically, socially viable and maintain the natural environment. So this is one of the first example of sustainable city. It is in Dubai. It is a 46 hectare city located in Dubai land and uh, it is having zero like energy need at zero need for energy. It means it is uh, developing all its energy on its own. It is having a pollution-free environment. It is having a very good health infrastructures. And uh, uh, there is no service charges. Like uh, Dr. Jack Ma told, automatically the water is being recharged into the ground and then used another thing. So same thing, like uh, everything is automated and uh, we are they are maintaining the nature. So this has got the award also uh, by there is one company which make the sustainable cities and they have also got the award for making this beautiful sustainable city where a lot of people are living, but it is very sustainable. So this is a good model. Now we always talk about green city when it comes to sustainability. First is the green city. In that thing, we have to take care of the blue environment and the green environment. So uh, these uh, blue environment and green environment, uh, this is very important. Like, like uh, when the water cycle is there, so like low in infiltration, high runoff, then low groundwater flow. These are the, uh, this is the situation in the urban area. Low water in the river. But once we start making the infiltration more, and we try to make the groundwater flow smoother, then it will make a sustainable blue environment. Like the river will also have the water and all the uh, water coming from the rain, it will go into the ground and flow to the uh, like rivers. So this is very good. So we have to take care of a pervious, uh, semi-pervious or pervious uh, surfaces where the water can infiltrate and go to the 
on the ground subsurface and then finally to the river. And uh, so this is a good blue cycle. Then another is the street escape. Now this is the urban escape generally we have. Everything is constructed, but we need this kind of space like green where oxygen is there. They're absorbing carbon. So this kind of a blue environment. This is called the complete green city. Now I less so I will come. I'm going to two case studies for uh, where I used remote sensing and GIS to make the city green and uh, how to make the city green. So first example is from the Bangkok. This city, uh, this is the capital city of Thailand and very big city. This is the uh, some of the photographs of the city. You can see uh, the downtown Sukhumvit and Sathorn area, highly urbanized, a lot of high skyscrapers are there. Then you can see the city road network. There are three or four levels of roads in the city. And to go to different parts, still the problem is there sometimes. And uh, now you can see the different levels of road, like one level here, second level, third level, etc. So we can see different levels of roads now in the city to take the people from one place to another. And especially when these, uh, like, uh, elevated roads when you have to go to the ground then there is a traffic jam like a water all the bottles are opening at the same time and then it is clogged so this is the thing the world cities now i come to the situation of this earth three percent of the earth's land is occupied by the cities only three percent but almost 60 to 80 percent energy consumption is there in the cities and 75% of carbon emissions are there because almost say 70% people are living there. All the commercial activities are there. So these are the situation. Like so though we have huge land available, but only 3% land urban areas are developed. So there is a huge demand for the city. So we have to ponder on this issue. Now let us see the a map of historical map of Bangkok. So you can see the dark color. This is 1850 Bangkok. It is just around 25, less than 25 square kilometer. This was the city of Bangkok. Then slowly it has become bigger and bigger. And now you can see it is spreading. So now the total area is almost say. Uh, 1200 or 1300 square kilometer. That is the Bangkok area. So from 25 in 1850, now it is spreading all over. And it is not going to stop. There has been a 16 fold increase from 1944 to 2002 in the Bangkok. So 16 fold increase is there. And from the center point, 80 kilometer expansion is there in the Bangkok. So a lot of urbanization is there. Now, when we make the city urban area, built up areas, so they are uh, taking away our green environment. So this is the thing. If we increase the green environment, then we need some place. So if the land use transformation is there for built up area, we lose the greenery. It will impact the quality of life. It affects the sustainable city, ecological, Ecology will be lost and it will affect the sustainability of the city. And uh, WHO, World Health Organization, says that for every person, we need nine square meter of urban green space. But we have done the study uh, ourselves and some other study, we find we have only 3.49 square meter in 2010. So wherever, wherever was, uh, there was like four square meter per person in 2008. Now, within two years, it has decreased again. 3.49 square meter, we need nine square meter of green space. Now, if I see the parks, how much park we should have? So now you can see here, Bangkok is having 1.46 square meter per capita park space. It is not a green space, but park. And uh, 
square meter, we have the green space. So this is the park. And then Copenhagen is the topmost square meter of the park. So this is a very good. Instead of nine, it is having 43 in Copenhagen. So now you can see this is Copenhagen, Mexico, and other cities. So I think uh, these are the guidelines that we should follow. Now objective, this work, land cover classification of time series data. So we have done the land cover classification of Bangkok city. To assess the gains and losses in green and the built environment, to determine the land use, land and cover changes in the area. And finally, objective was to model the land use change, uh, land use change and uh, ecology sustainability in the Bangkok city. So this is the methodology. So we have taken satellite data from 1994, 2004, 2012, and then we have done all the processing, etc. I'll not go in the detail. Then we have done the modeling using GIS. So this is the remote sensing part, and uh, this is the GIS part, and again GIS analysis using Idrisi Selva and ArcMap 10.2, and we have done the uh, Markov uh, analysis for the land use uh, modeling for the future. So we have done 1994, then 2004, and 2012, and then you can see how the green spaces are written away by the urban, so red colors you can see here. And then after some time, people in, uh, in this country are a little bit careful, so they again create some green space within that. So how the land use is changing, satellite data can help us. This is the graph coming from the GIS that how the built up area is increasing from 1994 to 2012. So, you can see the rise and the downfall of the green area, little bit increase in the cultivated area, then water is almost same, and barren area is also reducing. So this is the time series land cover classification of Bangkok, and we have already seen, so 1994, and you can see 2012, lot of uh, eastern side also getting uh, sorry western side is also getting a lot of urbanization and of course it is spreading in all the direction but western side is too much now so green cover is losing continuously and urbanization is increasing that is the scenario in india also in many big cities then we have created buffer zones from the center of the city like five kilometer buffer zone 10 kilometer buffer zone 15 kilometer 20, 25, and 30. And then we have uh, taken the public parks. In different buffer zone, how many public parks are there? So we can see here in the central area, a lot of public parks are there. But as we go away, there are less public parks. So there is a scope to increase the public parks where the people can go walk around, do exercises, get some oxygen. This is the plan of Bangkok uh, Metropolitan Authority. So dark colors are the existing public parks and the uh, black circles are the proposed public parks. So there is a huge plan of increasing the public parks. So you can see that there is a plan here to make the city green and uh, provide the good quality of life to the people. So I have already discussed uh, about this one. Now, Instead of taking the whole Bangkok, we can also do the study by uh, district wise. Uh, small, small districts are there. And then we can do the same kind of analysis for each district. So, not only the whole city, we can take each district or sub district and do the analysis using GIS. And that will also tell us how to manage the small, small areas. And then within the less fund, every year the city can be made green. So I will quickly move from here. So this is the same thing from the GIS analysis some result. How the in the buffer area green green cover is going down, built up cover is up, and then in within five kilometer, lot of loss of the green cover, uh, five to ten a uh, green cover and built up almost same, and then fifteen green cover is more from the center point and the built up is less. So as you go away from the city. 15 kilometer and more, 
you get a very good environment. So this is the thing we can also find out for each city where the environment is good, quality of life is better than the downtown. So I will not go. So we have done the study for each of the sub district. What is the green cover, built up cover, complete analysis, and then now change. Uh, how much area has changed since 1994 to 2012? So total area was for whole Bangkok uh, bigger area, 2,063 square kilometer. 825 has changed, and 342. It has changed from greenery to built up. This is alarming. And then we have to reclaim some area for making it green. So there is 42% of the greenery was lost in the last 18 years. So conclusion and recommendation from the Bangkok study, we find that satellite images are useful data and time series data is available in different resolution. Different type of sensors are there in the satellite. India is almost number one in the remote sensing, so we can use that data and we can use these images and create the database for our city. And then we can use in GIS uh, for decision making, like which area we can claim to uh, be barren and then convert that into the green area and in increase the green cover. So we can also project it. What will happen in 2030 if we do not do anything and then uh, this study was also projecting that data for 2030. Now I come to another case study done uh, by one of my Indian students for Vishaka Patnam. This is the Vishaka Patnam city and uh, how this, this is also a smart city. How to make this key city green that we have done some work. So the main objective of the city is to find out the greenless level of Vishaka Patnam urban environment using the land use, land cover mapping, the status of the enhancing the level of greenness, the specific objective, and how to enhance the level of greenness. Like in the previous study, we did not go to the next level, how to enhance the greenness. Here, we will do the change analysis, everything. So we have taken 20 years data, every five years time is 10, and then, uh, we will determine the gain and losses in the uh, land cover types like green environment and built environment. Then we will do future prediction for 2013, 2050, and AHP model was used for uh, even the Markov analysis. And AHP model was done. Markov was done for uh, projecting it for the 2030 and 2050, and AHP was done to find out which area is most suitable or suitable for green area enhancement. So this is Vishaka Bhattam. I think uh, many of the participants might have gone there. Uh, uh, kilometer. The growth in urban area is observed in and uh, because of increasing population and development of industries and port area. So this is the thing, like taking satellite data, processing, creating the database for land use, land cover, and after that finding changes, then using this data for projecting into the future, like 2030 and 50, then using the information for modeling the green area enhancement using AHP analytical hierarchy process. So this is in a nutshell the methodology so this is the land use land cover map of 1994 and 2000 for Vishaka Patnam. And uh, we can see red color is the urban area and blue color is the water and uh, dark color is the forest. Uh, there is some forest around here and then dark green color and then barren land is yellow color. Green is uh, green is the green land here. And so this is the situation in say 1995, this is in 2000, and now you can, sorry, 1994 and 2000, now can you can see how the urban area has increased. So alarming increase is there in Vishakhapatna, much more faster than Bangkok also. And now 2005, further increase, but I'm very happy that some of the barren land has been converted into green areas. So there is a good practices going on there. So that also we found out, and here also we can see some areas have become green. 
from the yellow areas. So already Vishaka municipality is doing a very good work. And uh, I think using GIS, we can monitor what is going on and also propose uh, what can be done. So this is the land, the land use land cover map of 2015. So we can find out for each parcel what are the land use and land cover. So built up area is increasing as we see here in all slowly water body was almost stagnant but now because of port some areas are inundated and then agriculture is little bit down barren areas are getting reduced maybe some barren area is going to uh, urban development then forest area is little bit down green is down so uh, maybe this barren area can also be used for green enhancement. Now, this is the change map of Vishaka Patnam from 1995 to 2005, 2015. And uh, we can see here red color is unchanged areas and the green color is changed to other areas. So these are the uh, maps uh, we can get. Green to built up changed to 28 square kilometer unchanged areas 263 barren land to built up is 41 square kilometer so this is alarming like 28 greenery is gone 28 square kilometer so 39 percent of green area was lost in last 20 years now so we can do very detailed gis analysis and we find that uh, greenery from 1995 till 2005 how it has reduced from 91 square kilometer to 63 built up area gone up, then other land use also we can find out. Now we have used Markov analysis, Markov modeling, and then uh, in 2030, if the same thing goes on, so we can project it and we can find out a transition probability matrix in uh, Markov analysis we can develop. And uh, for any time span, we can project the map and we can develop the map for 2030, 2050, so this is 2030 map and uh, we can see how the urban area will grow, how the greenery will be reduced. Then this is the map in 2050. So we can see 2050 what will happen. And uh, we can see urban area from 2030 to 50 will grow like 231 to 243 square kilometer and green area will be down from 45 to 30. So this is the scenario that will happen. Already the urban area is stressed of the land, so we can imagine. So if they are not converting to built up, at least high rise building will come up. So more carbon emission will be there and then we need green space for that. So if the green area reduces, the quality of life will go down, pollution will be there, uh, respiratory diseases will come. So now for enhancement of the green area, how to find out suitable land for green area. So we, we have used analytical hierarchy process technique and number of factors have been used. For each factor, we have used sub factors also, like vegetation, distance from urban, distance to water bodies, bad land, forest, and greenery. And then we have used these factors for finding out which area is suitable for green environment and uh, prioritize that most suitable, highly suitable, less suitable or not suitable. And then we can use in a policy guideline to convert that into green areas, park, etc. Now this is the map, which is land suitability map of green areas in Vishakha uh, Patna Municipal Corporation. And uh, so we have used AHP. We have done the questionnaire survey for AHP with the experts in municipality and some top uh, academicians in that area. And then we have created this map. So the yellow color is less suitable for green. Uh, dark color, which is very, very less somewhere, is su most suitable. And this green is highly suitable for making the green cover. Then light green area is also uh, like moderately suitable. So now at least from GIS, we can find out where are the areas which can be converted to make the area green. And inside also we can find out there are patches. 
where green land can be developed so without much conflict with the local land use which is going on these areas are still available to be converted into the green areas so so we can find that uh, highest suitable areas are square kilometer suitable areas are 68 square kilometer moderately is 51 lot of area can find out to make a green environment so suitable barren land for green in bangkok almost 39 square kilometer area is easily available for making the vishakhapatnam green and then it will improve the quality of life and the livability of vishakhapatnam comparison of suitability map with maximum likelihood classified map of 2015 so if we take a uh, uh, comparison like from gis we have got this map for a uh, suitable green area development and now we can compare it with the existing land use map which is obtained from maximum likelihood classification yeah. so we can find out how we can uh, make the area green so yellow areas are not suitable brown areas are not suitable and then we can take only the dark green and uh, moderately green area for converting into the green so this is the way uh, we can do for any city this kind of mapping to make the cities green conclusion is is the last slide satellite remote sensing and gis have the full potential for land use and land cover scenario prediction for the future uh so satellite give the data and gis can do analysis and predict the future land use land cover scenario a uh, lot of techniques are there then we can develop policy guideline to convert the barren lands uh, for or unused other lands into the green cover and then ecologically sustainable city can be developed which can absorb all the carbon and provide better health to the people and i think uh, that will fulfill the goal of sdg 11 Uh, to a greater extent thank you very much thank you so much uh, professor dr nitin tripathi garu it was really an exciting presentation and also as the when we are introducing manju said that you have 197 publications and i have seen that mostly all of them with the higher citations you have guided uh, 44 doctorate this is and 148 masters that it will give you your eminence and the field of expertise in addition to that you are the editor in chief of the leading journals and also young scientist award aict career award osaka university award and also our nit warangal distinguished alumni award so from all these we stand to that and first of all our sincere thanks to you sir for being with us and all to this uh, the programs which you have conducted sir you also started with the millennium goals number 11 sustainable cities yeah. and uh, and again we are very happy that jagumar sir also started so once again i request all the members participant to kindly go through this and there is a lot we need to learn in that at the end of this section i will elaborate little more on that and also sir you mentioned about the economical viable cities where the 46 hectares of land in dubai was constructed no service charges is something really amazing yes. and, and it's really expi- inspiring for us the green cities you also mentioned in the thailand elevated roads it is not common which all of us are knowing about that that's really another insight and also you systematically started with the research methodologies remote sensing uh, gis and uh, the bank of in 94 2004 2012 i'm sure that the panelists as the students as well as the teachers how systematically the research can be taken and you have two examples one caught in particularly from thailand and another from our indian city of visakhapatnam really by prat the contributions now i would like to tell all members the participant that civil engineering is the fundamental branch without that the human being cannot live 
So the contribution of the civil engineers being the first branch of civil in, branch of engineering, it's so vital for the human being than any other branch of engineering. Basic needs of the human being are addressed. Of course, the internet and other technologies are part of this, and that's how we are here today on this uh, virtual media. And the example of the Visagabatanam, the GIS monitoring help us the balancing the ecosystems and the future plans of 2030 using this ASP model, the most suitable for the enhancement. That's all been covered with you. That's really another exciting feature which has brought into that. That is, again, very much thankful for you. And also your projects jointly with the government and the municipalities, we can have a sustainable and development, better living for, a, for the human being. And your Marco model explaining the probability of the land cover in a large sense, and also your model to 2050. How does it look like? The land suitability for the green area and land. Sir, we are all very much enriched with your participation and this. And uh, when Jagumar sir said that uh, we have very special guest from Thailand, Nidin Tripadi sir, who is a prestigious alumni of this, a big clap on behalf of all the participants. And thank you, Nidin Tripadi sir and uh, Jagumar sir, for bringing him over here to this international participant. And also when I was going to the participant, all the panel members can see, but this one, we have seen that consistently more than 550 people are there, which again shows that the interest which I have shown from this. Now I think it's a time for the question and answering sessions. We will take the two question mod, I mean, questions in two different ways. One is from the chat box, which has already been addressed. And the second is uh, your answer so that we will take the questions also. And again, still we are on very good time. And uh, we will go for the first question. So maybe from the first question, Manchu, you can ask the first question to the panel members. Sure, sir. So we have a question like, uh, we have a pandemic now going on. This is affecting people with less immunity. Generally, doctors assess the condition of patients by conducting blood tests, and when some of the constituents increases beyond the limit, they say we are from the sickness. But they never give importance to the water level in our blood. We study that 90% of the blood in water is water, and 70% of our body is water. What is your opinion regarding the quantity and quality of water consumption? The question is. To Dr. K. V. Tekumar, sir. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. <laughs> you know, we have a water quality standard prescribed by the World Health Organization, and we have to maintain that water quality for our visibility. See, we can also have some relaxed uh, standards. Uh, unless we maintain the water quality to that standards, it's difficult to have a normal standard life that we have. Okay. So, uh, can, can you just repeat the question about that? Uh, Manju, can you just repeat the question about the blood part? Yes, sir. Sure. I'll repeat. Yeah. Uh, we have 90 percentage of the blood uh, is water and 70 percentage of our body is water. What is your opinion regarding the quantity and quality of water consumption? See, the quality, as I told you, there's a standard of standard fixed by the World Health Organization. And in our country, we got Indian standard institutions. So that's the quality that we have to maintain. Consumption, normally about two, three liters per head is the normal consumption of drinking water. And it also depends on the location. Like, for example, in a cold climate, water consumption is very less. In the hot climate, water consumption is more. So it also depends on the climate conditions and the constitution of the body. So there's nothing like standard uh, for this type of thing, except the water quality standards, which we'll have to maintain. OK? Yeah. OK. Uh, so another question. Where are swales supposed to be constructed? The swales are constructed by the roadside. In, in the in place of drains, you construct swales if there is place. So normally in a country state, it's difficult to construct, but when you're planning a city, swales can always be incorporated in the city in the initial stages. 
uh, that's or that's what is possible. Okay. In only Thank dense you. place, sales are not possible, right? Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Another question is just like the way the water was treated effectively in plants, will it be possible to increase immunity of human by consuming plants or switching on to a vegan diet? I think this is not relevant to this particular lecture anyway. Uh, see, uh, plants only improve the quality of the water. There are certain plants, you know, we identified around 25 varieties of plants which are available locally, which help to improve the quality of water before, you know, see the water that I got in Calicut, for example, is almost fit for consumption, but not really, you know, doesn't meet the standard as prescribed standard, but almost. With very little, you know, treatment, we can make it uh, very fit for human consumption. Right? Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Another question is, cities in Kerala like Irvanthapuram go flooded with a day heavy rain. Is there any solution to practice? Yeah, this is basically what I said, water sensitive urban design. Our design when you take, uh, when you do the city design, drainage is now considered as, as very important. They consider roads, they consider everything, but drainage is given least importance in any city. That's why we have the problem. We can always take care of this in the well, proper design of the drainage system. The Kerala's problem because I have studied uh, Calicut, I have studied Trivandrum, I have studied Kodam, I have studied Trishur, I have studied Kannur. Uh, these cities I have studied and given some solutions, but nothing is being implemented by the government. Now I think, sir, uh, we will take one or two questions uh, online. And uh, Hans Shaiban Munir is raising the hand. So please unmute and uh, so that you can raise. Or Zara Farooq, please ask your question. Kindly unmute and ask the question. Zara Farooq. Yes, please. Manjunath NK, please. If you are accidentally raise your hands, sir, please uh, lower your hands so that it comes on the priority as I see in the list. Manchunath NK. Okay, Manchu, go for the next question. Another question is Do we have a day? Data on per capita park in India. In India. Do we have data on per capita park in India? In India? Okay. Question, sir. Uh, Manju, you repeat the question again, please. Uh, the question is: Do we have per capita park area? No, we do not have such data. Ask to the next we question. Okay, that's it. Professor yeah. Jaikumar is right. Till now, we. Yeah. Do not have. Sir, we should. Have. Another question is: Yes, go ahead. Yes, can can national building codes include guidelines suited based on remote sensing sustainability? Yeah, this is a very good question. I think it is high time that there should be a code that how the remote sensing data and GIS can be used for certain purpose like say city planning. And uh, for building, I think not possible, but for city or say some kind of a, uh, you are making a big complex, then uh, high resolution satellite data can be used. And what are the things to be maintained for checking? So there is no need for physical survey now. So we can use high resolution satellite data and uh, they should be uh, there should be some, I think, codes for that one now. 
like all already some space policies are coming and i think this is a high time this is a very good question thank you okay sir another question is is proposed amendment in the environment assessment guide will hammer hamper more in the vision of green areas as it will drastically increase the built up area Uh, uh, please tell the question again. Uh, once again, okay, sir. If proposed amendment in the environment impact assessment guidelines will hamper more in the vision of green areas as it will drastically increase the built up area. I do not know what is the guideline right now, but uh, I think uh, we have to take the WHO or some uh, developed city guideline. For green spaces, and uh, we try to maintain that one. And uh, all all the city which are already developed, we cannot change that. But when we are planning the new satellite cities, we must adhere to the guideline in the master plan. Uh, that is only thing I can tell at the moment. Okay, sir. Another question is which GIS software is best for simulation? Yeah, even uh, nowadays using the Python programming, easily you can do the simulation in ArcGIS. So that is one thing. And even Quantum GIS, which is open source, there also you can do that. So I think it is possible. Okay, sir. Another one is GIS is available free in worldwide. Yeah, uh, there are uh, open source free software. The leader is the quantum GIS and GRASS. Now they are coming as a package. So people can download that GRASS package and quantum GIS and they can use it. Okay, sir. Another one is how much time taken by plants to remove the BOD? I think uh, Dr. Jay Kumar, it's not for me. I think this question is for Professor Jay Kumar or somebody else because this is sir, uh, Jay Kumar, sir, because of the power interruption, he's just uh, gone out. He's trying to get back. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, shall I ask the, another question? Sir, the initial costing for sustainable city, city or we, if we focus on net zero city, as a civil engineer, I found out people are not very much aware of this net zero concept. What should be the way to motivate people for net zero city or zero energy building? Yeah, I think uh, awareness is very poor. That is the why people are not ready. But uh, as Indian population uh, see the very high quality sustainable city in Dubai or Middle East or say Southeast Asia also, they, they are motivated and uh, many good practices are coming up. So I think uh, one thing is now I found it in Bangkok, a lot of companies are there which are putting the solar panels in complete office complex, universities free of cost. So that is reducing the electricity bill uh, drastically and they don't charge any money to the institution. They get do it free and then Whatever remainder electricity is, it goes to the grid. So uh, this is the thing. Uh, they should be told that there is a subsidy available by Thai government, of course, but Indian government is also giving. So I think uh, that will make the whole campus like a zero energy or net energy will be zero uh, consumed. So I think uh, whatever they are consuming, they will produce. Same thing for water recycling. I think uh, these two things can be motivated and many people have to do it, it's especially a city like Bangalore, etc., which are stressed. They must do it for water also. Okay, sir, sir anyway, comment over here. So even such systems are available and in Bangalore also people are providing with no uh, cost involved. 
they make uh, for education institutions so, and bigger campuses and all the systems are there and if any of the participants want the detail i'll get back to you so what they're asking is that you need to provide only the space and they will construct it completely free of cost and also they guarantee you that if for the initial 15 years or maybe some period of time depends upon the place uh, your electricity bill also will be reduced and after maybe the 15 16 17 whatever be the case um, they will hand over the plan free of cost to the party also such systems are existing here and also uh, to my best of knowledge uh, that such systems are already uh, available and they have submitted the proposal. So if anyone of you from the audience or yourself, you can contact me later. I'll give you the full details. Over to the next question. Sir, another question to Dr. Nidhin. Yeah. How can we get high resolution satellite images? Is this available for free of cost? Yeah, actually, uh, 30 meter Landsat data is freely available. And uh, if uh, education institution want for research purpose, then uh, worldview data is available. I have got it free for my students, which is just uh, uh, like uh, 25 centimeter or 50 centimeter data. So, and eight band data they give free. So, uh, but for other purpose, these high resolution data is not free. One has to pay, but uh, NRSC, if uh, there is some agreement, the one meter data is quite cheap, very, very cheap. So like say just uh, 15,000 rupees complete satellite data will come. So I think uh, uh, one can now count on that uh, one meter data easily can be available. Okay, sir. Another question from the same participant. Which software is suitable for land use, land cover map preparation? Okay, so... Uh, you can use, uh, suppose you are going for commercial software, I will say Iridas. Uh, lot of facilities are there for remote sensing data processing, image processing, creating the land use, land cover uh, maps. Later on, you need a GIS software to analyze this, superimpose with other kind of, say, socioeconomic, all kind of other data. So you need uh, Iridas as well as ArcGIS, that is the best solution. Otherwise, you can take quantum GIS and GRASS as a open source and free software. Okay, sir. Uh, one more question. Wherever we see there is a gradual or brisk process of urbanization going on with time, is it possible to have a reverse process to keep and en enhance green so that a balance can be achieved with time? Uh, one possibility is that. Uh, Right now, there is a very good pulling factor in the city, like good medical facility, business opportunities, education facility. If you create the same pulling factor outside the city, all the crowd will start moving outside the downtown, which is which has happened in London. So uh, people don't want to live inside the London. They want to live in suburban areas where a lot of facilities are there and uh, very good quality of life. So I think uh, some pulling factor is required now by the government to create the satellite centers, city centers, and then people will start moving to that one. So it is very much required because the life of the whole city is almost over now. So many like Varanasi and uh, ancient city, their life is almost over. And uh, if you, if anybody lives in the downtown of those cities, then there is no quality of life. So it is better to create some pulling factor uh, and satellite uh, townships so to get the people outside the city. Okay, um, our system, please upgrade a director BBS 2016, whatever you are visible to our panel, please. And also Jagumar sir will be shortly joining as a participant now. Please upgrade him also. You have some technical issues. Okay, over to Manju again. Thank you, sir. The last question is, Nowadays, a lot of concrete pavements are being constructed, which uh, does not allow water to percolate. Will it affect the infiltration and groundwater management? Yeah, actually, uh, Dr. Jakumar can, Professor Jakumar can answer it nicely. Uh, till he comes, I'm also a civil engineer. So here also, I'm in the committee of a lot of transportation engineering people. 
and uh, construction engineering infrastructure management. So we always encourage uh, semi-pervious type of surfaces, even the road also semi-pervious as much as possible and uh, not concrete roads. Concrete roads are uh, totally pervious, you know, impervious. So I think it is better to go for bituminous and semi-pervious kind of a surfaces so that it can absorb some water and uh, there can be some kind of uh, recharge. But uh, right now in urban areas, uh, people are doing all 100% construction. That is a very, uh, uh, means a negative thing which is happening. So I think uh, that is one thing. And another thing is uh, vertical gardens in Bangkok also. In Italy, it started like uh, they created a skyscraper and created gardens. Now in Bangkok, at least in all high rise buildings, they make one or two floors uh, as a garden. So people go there, <coughs> they go by elevator to those gardens, do the jogging inside that, do the exercise and uh, socializing. So now within the high rise buildings also gardens are coming up. So this is also a new trend. And I think uh, these good practices should be compiled as a guideline for city development and used. Sir, now uh, Jagmar sir is joined as a participant. Meanwhile, we will update him uh, to this uh, editorial panel board. We'll go to the next question from Dr. Barla sir. He's also joined with us. Sir Barla sir, please ask the question, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation made by Dr. Jagmar and Dr. Nitin. Sir, you keep your uh, mobile in the vertical position, sir. Yeah, yeah, fine. fine. That's fine. Okay, sir, please. Thank you for the wonderful presentations made by Dr. Jaikumar, sir, as well as Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Nathan. And uh, my question relates to the sustainability. Now, the sustainability can be Man has been plundering nature, and that is the root cause of non-sustainability. If we achieve sustainability, the only answer is to resolve, at least to some extent, the conflict between nature and man. Now, one way to that will be to, to see the policy the country is making, governments, public sector, private sector making must be centered at reducing consumption. Whatever it is, unless resources are limited, resources are not unlimited. Where funds are going unlimited. So unless policy directives are aimed at Reducing consumption, there is a number of ways of uh, uh, how man consumes uh, nature. Such a cannot all the reports on sustainability will be uh, in drain unless we. I would be grateful if both the speakers share their thoughts on this aspect. Thank you very much, sir. Over to you. Yeah, so. Professor Jack Mar, you, are, you want to go first? You can start. Okay. You can start. Okay. So, uh, thank you. So, uh, thank you for this question. Actually, this is in mind of everybody that we can be sustainable by reducing consumption. But I think uh, uh, if we also, my idea is to produce more and uh, like energy. And uh, so, use the solar non-conventional form of energy and uh, then use those things in our daily life go for led and other thing and try to reduce the consumption that way so produce uh, something which is renewable renewable like say solar energy and then energy devices we use which consume less so those things we can do now i come to the nature uh, regarding uh, cities, uh, they cannot be made small now because already they are there are already 
but future cities should be developed now. That means that uh, we have to develop future cities instead of growing the same city. Policies should be like uh, uh, some knowledge city can come, some other kind of cities can come. Uh, like for old people, one city can be developed. So I think uh, uh, there can be branding of the cities and development of cities where the new technologies can be implemented and experimented. So I think in that direction, we have to move faster and uh, we have to provide more services in those cities so that people can, can go there and then our cities can be sustainable. Second is water, which is going to be really scarce in the future. Energy we can produce, but water we have to is giving we have to use each drop so in thailand the very good practice by the king of thailand see the we have to adopt equality so whatever rainwater comes during now all the cities will have like inundation and then it will go to the ocean finally or reverse so he told that uh, each and every drop should be first put into the some monkey cheeks and then later on chew it so we should not let the water which is received by us to flow into the drains. We should have procedures to accumulate it somewhere and then try to use it when the dry season comes. So I think uh, conservation efforts are also needed a lot. Um, consuming less conservation and more and producing the devices which are uh, consuming less energy, producing devices which are more on dependent on natural resources which are renewable. I think those aspects can be uh, included in our uh, teaching, in our thesis, and awareness to our <coughs> student and our stakeholders. Dr. Barla, there's a very good question. That is a good question from your side. Can you hear yes, me? Sir. Yeah. See, we have a concept of water sensitive urban design. Any design that should be we do, it should be water sensitive. Now, unfortunately, what happens is there are many designs that are developed in Europe. We try to copy here. In Europe, it rains 300 days in a year, 200, 300 days in a year. Like, for example, in France, in UK, the number of rain days are about 200, 300. In our country, it rains only 60 days in a year. So, our water management custom is 60 days of rainfall, store it to use the remaining 300 days. So, for example, if I take the my place, Varangal, the rainfall is 900 millimeters in a year. This comes in 60 days. You take London, you take Paris, it rains 900 millimeters in 300 days. So we try to copy some of the technology you develop there. Our country it doesn't work. We have to have country specific, regional, regional specific uh, design that is very, very important. And uh, if, if, you know, we are trying, we have a whole hydrological cycle is now become man made hydrological cycle. Natural man made, we are converted into a man made hydraulic cycle. So, all this we are trying to reinvent uh, the, the technology. We have a technological, it's a dying wisdom. We had tremendous wisdom in the past on water management. That is dying. We are trying to reinvent all those old technologies. And whatever we try, try to do now is, is that, you know, in some of the countries they have uh, some norms like, you know, the total built up area shall not exceed. The total shaded area at 12 at 12 uh, uh, the mid, uh, 12 noon at 12 noon when all the trees give shade, shades that area should be more than the total built up area in any place that's a type of technology we try to bring back so, so there is a lot of things which we will have to do back do it and try to bring back the technology it's not that we are reinventing new we have forgotten the technology used in ancient days on the water management so now we have the concept of water sensitive urban design everywhere Thank you. Apart from water, I think we also need to focus on the uh, population control because it is the population growth which is adding to the unsustainability. Uh, that was another one. And uh, not only the water, but also the overall other materials, substances which the man consumes. If at all, we have to achieve the sustainability. Thank you, sir. Um, Manchu, we may go for one or two questions more, and then we'll wind up.
so time is getting up so take one or two questions more any more questions okay sir okay sir uh, sure sure can will be can we will be able to make kolkata as a sustainable place and how can be the work now can you repeat please i'm not able to uh, sorry sir i will repeat the question can we will be able to make kolkata as a sustainable city and how can be the work now I think workers also on you know kind of sustainable. There is a lot of involvement of the local political people in that. I mean, it's just we cannot do it. The involvement of the stakeholders are very important to make it sustainable. So that is very very important. Anything the involvement of stakeholders are very important. Uh, I mean, it has to be a, a integrated uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, if I. Yeah. can uh, supplement little bit so i think uh, uh, kolkata needs a high level of modernization now uh, they are still using the tram and uh, if we go to netherland uh, there so they are using tram but very sophisticated so i think the whole city needs a complete modernization and restructuring the city is almost uh, too much crowded and uh, very difficult to handle but if you go away from the in calcutta there is a high tech city very nice city uh, yeah, yeah. so i think uh, um, the whole city needs a restructuring and a complete change of the systems which is huge task rather than uh, some new calcutta can be developed very modernized that will be much easier and people will love it because many buildings are uh, they have come to their life now they should be demolished like in bombay many buildings fall down same thing will happen is happening in fact and kolkata these lanes are very small so i think uh, it was a very great city and but i think uh, there is a life of everything so it has to be redone and uh, whole thing i think people should try to go for modern cities now like a smart city we are talking so we can make some modern cities with all facilities with all kind of guidelines being followed otherwise uh, uh, i mean sir uh, retrofitting and everything is not going to solve the purpose properly okay, okay sir, sir. Uh, one more question to dr neba uh, nitin kumar uh, so what are the process we want to do in gis for land use and land cover processing is that only digitization or any other process needed yeah actually digitization is only for old maps but once you have the satellite data or uav data then you can directly go for the classification nowadays earlier we used to do supervised classification go for uh, ground sampling and then try to train our classifiers but nowadays using artificial intelligence machine learning directly we can give the data it can form the cluster and land use can be mapped so i think uh, now very sophisticated systems are there in google earth engine also you can do land use land cover mapping so i think uh, people can explore that and if you need further information you can always reach me and then i will help you okay sir uh, uh, this uh, this much only the questions from the uh, attendee thank you so much thank you and uh, thank you very much and it was really a wonderful session from uh, professor jay kumar sir professor nitin tripathi sir and uh, with all these uh, participants uh, over here staying with us and let us uh, continue and uh, we will uh, come back on tomorrow also and just for the information of all the participants kindly fill the feedback form so that we will get a feedback so that it will be inspiring for you for us as well as uh, we'll also give a certificate for the participants and uh, there are lots of appreciations coming for the both the panel members uh, nitin sir as well as professor jagmar sir also and uh, we will share the links in the chat box so you can also fill up maybe another half an hour we'll uh, keep it open also so that roughly around 115 130 at that time we'll keep our feedback link open 
still if you have not come i am requesting all my team members to repost that uh, link into the chat box so that you can uh, fill up the forms also and again tomorrow also we'll continue with our programs uh, with the other uh, distinguished panel members tomorrow we'll have engineer sriniti anandram and the managing director of geodesic techniques they are the people who have built up this uh, 32 acres of uh, mumbai airport and uh, lots of other construction and dr alfred j kalyanpu is uh, also joins him from joining from Tennessee Technological University, United States of America. That's uh, tomorrow's program. And uh, once again, thank you all for being with us, all the panel members. All, all the participants. Uh, COVID-19 is part of this for this, uh, making these events uh, happen. So on behalf of all these participants and uh, MBITs and the COVID cell, Nitin sir, Professor Jagumar sir, Professor Dr. Barley sir, who was the inspiration of us. Uh, we started this webinar with the 47 people, and that is the origin of this. And we've gone up to this even uh, 100, 1,800, 2,000 people and all. Today with this civil engineering, more than 550, 600 participants attended and continuously, that's a real great and uh, we are looking forward for uh, all the participants again looking for all the programs also once again thank you very much all for you and namaskar thank you see you then have a nice time thank you thank you all thank you very much uh Jagmar, sir anything else you wanted to say concluding remarks sir fine it was i mean it's a experience for all of us okay Nitin, sir, any concluding remarks sir? Already left. Okay, then thank you all. Chani, madam, to address. You are muted now. Both sessions were very nice, and we have got a lot of information. Thank you, both of the participants. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. We'll see you. I'm also again reposting this uh, feedback link also so that in case if somebody didn't get it also. Thank you all. Bye bye. Closing down. Uh, so tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do it offline, sir. We'll do that offline. Sir.